react. So uh, if your EHC fluid is completely healthy and all your uh, your tests are, if you do uh, a wide variety of tests, uh, the ones that we have recommended, and everything is within normal parameters, I do not see a problem with it. Um, the problem will occur if you have already some contamination in your system, some metal soaps forming. Um, these will will very quickly block a one micron filter, and uh, you know you will very quickly run into an issue. Um, so it's it's possible. Yes, there's no issue with additives. It's it will not um, uh, take out any. Halo, selamat siang. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Kami Halo, ucapkan terima ya. kasih. Good afternoon, Lars. Thank you for Thank joining you. us on this uh, sharing knowledge webinar. Happy to be here. Ya, yeah. um, saya ucapkan terima kasih kepada Bapak, Ibu, beserta webinar yang bisa mengikuti sharing knowledge pada siang hari ini. Adapun sharing dengan judul fosfat ester atau IHC fundamental and maintenance specific terkait dengan fosfat ester fundamental, oil degradation, oil condition monitoring, dan maintenance. Dan tentunya solusi-solusi yang akan disampaikan oleh Raj. Sebelumnya kami informasikan pemateri pada siang webinar, webinar siang hari ini yaitu Mr. Raj Van Dorp. Uh, thank you for joining. And then uh, Lars saat ini berada di Singapura sejak 2013 dan aslinya atau asalnya dari Belanda. Kemudian uh, untuk pengalamannya itu sudah banyak sekali dari mulai industri otomotif dan lubricant additive industry. Awalnya bekerja di uh, manager di Bosch Workshop konsep di Belgia sebelumnya join di BRD Internasional sebagai sales manager untuk lubricant aditif. BRD sendiri merupakan anak perusahaan Petronas Chemical Berhad dan Lars bekerja di divisi lubricant aditif cukup lama ya sekitar 10 tahun dan sebagian besar dedikasinya untuk meningkatkan bisnis di area Asia, Asia Pasifik. Saat ini, uh, Lars banyak pengalaman di lubricant chemistry, teknologi, dan international business. Dan uh, di perusahaan Freetech Internasional sebagai general manager di Asia Pasifik. Hari ini Lars akan sharing pengalaman pada lubricant fundamental dan monitoring. Terus kemudian uh, bagaimana menjaga data oil paint, khususnya di fosfat ester fluid. Uh, kemudian bagaimana uh, pengaruhnya terhadap umur oil dan menjaga reliability dari aset. Semoga dengan sharing knowledge pada webinar siang hari ini kita bisa mendapatkan insight dan uh, pengalaman ya untuk bisa diterapkan di tempat uh, Bapak atau Ibu. Kemudian webinar ini kurang lebih uh, satu jam dan diharapkan untuk pertanyaannya bisa di chat, di kolom chat untuk nantinya di akhir sesi eh, akan disampaikan ke Lars untuk nantinya Lars akan menjawab pertanyaan-pertanyaan yang Bapak Ibu sampaikan. Oke, mungkin untuk mempersingkat waktu, Lars, uh, you can proceed for your today sharing knowledge, yes? Thank you very much, Adi. Uh, appreciate the introduction. Let's start off with sharing my screen so we can move to the presentation. Just a quick check, Adi. Can you see my screen right now? Um, not yet, maybe still. Not more. yet. Okay. Now we can see it, yes. 
Okay. Apologies for this. Let's see. Um, okay. Okay, now, now you should be able to see it, right? Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you everybody for joining today on the topic of uh, phosphate ester fluids, a very interesting, a very specific topic uh, about the fundamentals and maintenance of these fluids, specifically in uh, uh, EHC applications. So Adi gave already, I believe, a very uh, nice introduction. Thank you for that. So my name is uh, Lars van Dijk. I am currently the general manager of Fluitech, uh, responsible for the Asia Pacific region uh, uh, I'm based in Singapore, I've been in Singapore since 2013, and it's my pleasure to share some knowledge with you today. I would like to also give a special thanks to uh, PTT Awa for hosting this webinar, and they spent a lot of effort and time to organize this, and we're highly appreciative for this platform to be able to share knowledge uh, to you. So a little bit of an overview about what we are going to do today. Um, I will give a bit of an introduction about Fluitech, a quick one. Uh, about our company, then we will talk about the chemistry, the backbone of uh, uh, phosphate ester fluids. We'll talk about how these fluids degrade, the various degradation modes that they encounter. We will talk a bit about condition monitoring practices you could apply to, to manage uh, their degradation, give some recommendations about the test methods that are available, and overall high overview of the fluid maintenance that are related to, uh, to phosphate esters. And because it's quite a lot of content that we need to treat within one hour, so I would like to request for questions to be asked after the, the presentation, and we'll do our best to, uh, to, to leave some time for, for questions at the end. If we cannot answer your question today, uh, both Adi and myself, we will make sure that we can answer your question at a later stage. Um, we, don't worry, we will be here to answer any questions uh, later on as well. So let's get started uh, with the introduction uh, of Fluitech. Our company, the name already says a little bit, we are active in fluid technologies related to industrial oils. Uh, our operating um, standards are based on measuring at the customer, give tailor-made consultation and tailor-made uh, treatment programs. Fluitech is an environmentally so uh, social uh, company. Uh, we are a responsible company. By managing and measuring the industrial equipment's health, we can lengthen the life of fluids, which results in significant uh, CAPEX and OPEX savings to the customer, but also has a very positive impact on the environment because by increasing reliability and efficiency, we reduce the CO2 output of plants, but also by lengthening the life of fluids, we reduce the, uh, the waste that companies produce. This has led to a solar impulse uh, label for efficient solutions. And more recently, we have been recognized with a certified B Corp corporation. Um, so this all results in lowering of gas house uh, emissions, uh, greenhouse uh, sorry, uh, emissions, um, and reducing of waste streams and increasing energy efficiency. Fluitex headquarters is in the Netherlands on Dordrecht near uh, Rotterdam. Uh, however, our main production and uh, R&D facility is actually in New Jersey in the USA. Uh, for Asia, our uh, local headquarters is based in Singapore, and we work with uh, distributors and partners such as PTT Aura in all regions to extend our, our sales force uh, there and to be close to the customer. And we also have a production joint venture in Melbourne, uh, Australia. For Fluitech, it all um, started and it still uh, is very much about understanding and solve, solving this problem called varnish. <coughs> Apologies. So varnish, as you can see here from this picture, uh, consists of various chemistries uh, uh, that are uh, a result of various degradation methods that we find in oil. And they can uh, consist of a lot of different kinds of chemistries and they can, can have a lot of different origins. So varnish is only one word but it's actually a very broad uh, area of expertise that Fluitech has specialized themselves in. And because it's so broad, you can see that it also is prevalent in many different industries. Actually, in most of the, uh, of the big industries in the world, you'll see that the lubricants they are used are in some way uh, experiencing varnish-related issues. By experiencing on this and tackling this issue, we have had a positive impact on the environment. We've saved a lot of... Uh, CO2, as you can see, and a lot of unnecessary oil uh, from being wasted prematurely. Um, this is a very good uh, 
result, of course, in this current environment where this topic becomes more and more important for all companies uh, to consider. So the reason why customers specifically trust Fluidec to, to, to help them solve and uh, increase the reliability of their equipment is because we offer unique and superior products which enable us to tailor the solution to the customer uh, specific requirements. We act on science, we prioritize science in everything we do. Everything that we have uh, put into the market always has a very strong, solid scientific base. We're not a marketing company, we are a science company. We have a 25 years of proven track record and industry specific experience. We work through major OEMs and major oil companies uh, who recommend our products together with their equipment or together with their fluids. We add value by increasing the customer efficiency and reliability. We create a unique ROI on our solutions and increase the bottom line of our customers. And also our unique and specified approach ensures uh, a risk-free solution for our customers because sometimes there is some uh, resistance to, to adding things to the lubricant, but we, uh, we can ensure uh, risk-free solutions. And by this, we create a legacy. Uh, we are on the road uh, with the whole world uh, towards zero industrial waste. So that's a very nice thought. I think uh, at some point we end up at zero industrial waste. So let's dive into today's main topic, uh, the phosphate ester fluids uh, for an EHC system. Let's talk a bit about the fundamentals and maintenance. So, apologies. so the main reason for using uh, phosphate ester fluids in uh, EHC system is the, the fact that these, um, these reservoirs often operate under a high pressure and in, uh, in the presence of, uh, of steam. So um, in the event of a leak, a regular oil will have auto combustion in this kind of uh, situation or auto ignition. Um, however, a phosphate ester fluid is self-extinguishing, meaning that if you take away the heat source, it does not auto-combust. There is no auto-ignition, or at least the auto-ignition temperature is very high. This means that in the event of a fire and the oil catches fire and it drips away from the, the heat source, uh, it, will no longer, uh, uh, it will no longer combust, so it will uh, extinguish. This means that the fire will not spread. Whereas a regular oil will auto combust and the, spire, the fire will spread throughout the whole system. So the main reason for using phosphate ester fluids is not because they are biodegradable or nice to your skin or low toxicity or whatever, but it's really safety. Safety is the main reason for using a phosphate ester. And the safety is obtained by the higher auto ignition temperature. So applications for phosphate ester fluids are, for example, steel mills, uh, Navy ships, Aircraft systems, aircraft hydraulic systems, uh, you can imagine that uh, they need to be fire resistant. Um, and of course, our main topic today, electrohydraulic control units of uh, steam turbines. So as already mentioned, phosphate ester fluids help prevent uh, fires and their entering into the market actually uh, came as a result of several catastrophic fires uh, in, in several plants where uh, it was found that uh, the need for uh, self-extinguishing fluid was, was very, uh, very prevalent and uh, something had to be done to correct uh, uh, this, this practice. So that's why phosphate ester fluids are currently in the market. Here you can see a little bit of an example of it. In this video. So here you can see a test. Uh, we demonstrate what happens to a PAG, so not a phosphate ester fluid, but a polyalkyl glycol, in the situation of a high pressure leak on a hot pipe surface. So let's see what happens. Here you can see the heat source, the oil combust, the drips onto the pipe. Now, the most concerning part here is act not actually the fire on the pipe. This is, this is not uh, the most concerning. The most concerning part is the fact that the fire uh, spreads and this can lead to a catastrophic uh, fire in the plant or even explosion when it uh, goes into uh, high pressure uh, environments. And even when the heat source is taken away, the fire will continue to burn and possibly spread then uh, throughout the plant. So in reality, in reality, this is actually a common source of plants being completely 
consumed by fire in a very sh uh, short period of time. So here, this really is double. So let's compare this then to the fire resistance of phosphate ester fluid. So here we see a similar test uh, with a phosphate ester fluid. And as you can see here, the temperature is even higher, 749 degrees, and the pipe is actually glowing red. Uh, you will notice uh, later on that the oil actually burns. You see, the oil itself burns. But the main difference we observe is in this area where uh, the fire is self-suppressing. So when the heat source is no longer acting upon the oil, the fire stops. The smoke, mind you, here is still very toxic, so you don't want to breathe that. Uh, but the main result that we have by using a phosphate ester fluid is that the fire will not spread as easily as with a PAG. So uh, therefore, after a number of fires, PEs are now a must. PE stands for phosphate ester fluid, sorry that I used the abbreviation. They are now a must in certain applications that have these kind of environments uh, to prevent the fire spreading catastrophically throughout the plant. So that's the main reason and background for using a phosphate ester fluid. Now let's look at the chemistry. So the main uh, difference uh, in backbone chemistry, as we like to call it, the base chemistry, is xylanated, xylanated versus butylated uh, phosphate ester fluid. So xylanated chemistry is actually the older chemistry, and this has less biodegradability and uh, higher toxicity. Uh, the butylated chemistry is the more the newer mole molecule, which has a better uh, biodegradability and is less toxic, so much more friendly to the environment. Uh, also, the butylated chemistry has uh, much higher uh, oxidative stability, uh, as you can see here, excellent for versus good. So the industry is actually moving towards butylated uh, chemistry, but xylanated chemistry has one. Uh, one distinct uh, advantage over uh, butylated chemistry, and that's the hydrolytic stability. So they, uh, they keep water out of the fluid. Butylated chemistry, however, despite its many advantages, does not uh, operate well in the presence of water because it actually attracts water. So it's, uh, uh, it's hydrolytic. And this has uh, a result because when water is present in a phosphate ester, uh, these fluids do not perform well. Water makes them degrade. It actually degrades and decomposes the molecule. So we want to have a very good condition monitoring system in place when you're, you're using a butylated uh, phosphate ester to ensure that you do not have a sudden degradation of your, of your oil. And here we can see this, uh, this illustrated. Um, the hydrostop, uh, the hydrostopic, if, hydroscopic effect, apologies, can attract water, uh, which will then degrade the oil quicker. You can clearly see here uh, hydrolysis, hydrolysis of xylanated versus butylated. So here the oil has uh, went through hydrolytic testing and uh, the xylanated was barely affected by this, whereas the butylated you can see completely degrade and uh, had a lot of degradation byproducts on the MPC patch. This is a membrane patch chromatry test. And also the copper strip. Uh, this is a copper, uh, uh, copper strip under ASTM D130. You can see here completely degraded. Uh, so that's, that's pretty bad. You don't want this in your systems. So the butylated chemistry offers a lot of benefits and that's why the, the, the industry is moving in that direction. And this is definitely a positive development, a very good thing. However, butylated chemistry needs to be monitored closely and with tight tolerances when it comes to water. When you do that, the butylated chemistry is a beautiful chemistry and uh, it can give you a perfect uh, long life fluid. But we'll come back to that a little bit more later on. So what are the various degradation modes that we see in phosphate ester fluids? Well, we already talked a little bit about hydrolysis. Another uh, degradation mode is microdieseling. I'll explain a little more on that. And then we have soap and varnish formation in, uh, in the fluid. First and foremost, however, is hydrolysis. So the reaction byproducts from hydrolysis actually create various acidic uh, compounds. These will affect the TAN number of the oil. So maybe you have already heard about this. If you operate a phosphate ester fluid, uh, you, will, you may have uh, been given the advice already that you need to closely monitor your uh, TAN number, the acidity of your oil. Um, also, whenever these acids are being created, there's another byproduct called alkyl phenols, 
they can actually react and oxidate. This creates varnish and eventually leads to deposits in the systems. The acids that are being created react with molecules. Um, these create further acids, and that's how you end up with an autocatalytic process, meaning that the process itself accelerates the process. So you end up with, a, with an accelerating cycle. That's why it's important to, to prevent this from happening in the first place. And we'll go into how you can do this action. And so here you can see these uh, reaction byproducts from hydrolysis creating uh, the alkyl phenols molecules. And let's see what, what's uh, so uh, worrying about that. So every time an acid is created, it also creates an alkyl phenols. Alkyl phenols are submissive to oxidation. They can undergo oxidation. And when they do, they become a varnish compound. So one of these many varnish compounds that I've, uh, that I've shown you earlier can also be uh, an alkyl, alkyl phenol chemistry that's at the base of it. So there's varnish being formed in your system. So here you can see a bit about the process, how actually hydrolysis at the beginning, so water ingression to the oil, that leads to chem chemistries that can ultimately create varnish. So also keep in mind that in an EHC system, varnish is more harmful uh, than, for example, in the turbine oil. So in, in an EHC system, varnish and varnish prevention and mitigation is actually more important than, let's say, for turbine oil. Here we see some uh, examples of varnish uh, in the system here in the reservoir in the tubing and in the submerged uh, screw pump in this case. So you can see here a depiction of how this autocatalytic process that takes place within phosphate ester fluids actually happens. So you have some water and you have some heat uh, acting on your phosphate ester fluids, which leads to hydrolysis. This process creates acids and acids actually increase the conductivity and they reduce the resisti res resistivity of the oil. And this leads to streaming uh, corrosion or electrokinetic wear. They can react with metals in the system to actually form uh, metal soaps. And these are solids in your system that needs to be filtered out by mechanical filtration. Uh, but this can lead to air retention. So there's more oxygen present inside, inside your oil, which then leads to oxidation. Uh, oxidation leads to further creation of, of, uh, of acids. So there are more acids being creation, created, which again leads to all this and uh, uh, accelerates the oxidation uh, uh, process. So what this means is that uh, uh, the bottom line of this is actually you want to remove the byproducts of water, heat and hydrolysis so that acids uh, cannot uh, become autocatalytic and cannot become self-sustainable. So we want to remove basically the acids in this situation as quickly as possible. So microdieseling is another mode of degradation in phosphate esters. So microdieseling is basically the collapse of a bubble uh, under pressure inside your oil. So if you have, uh, for example, entrained air or air pockets in your, in your oil, they can collapse under, under pressure, and there's pressure being, uh, being uh, exerted on the oil. When a bubble collapses, you end up with a, with a very small, it's on a micron level, a molecular level even, uh, a micro jet, because there's fluid being displaced from one place to the other. And this happens so fast that it creates heat. So it creates heat on a molecular level, and you end up with a sub-atomic uh, carbonaceous particle which is actually on a micron level, a, a soot particle or a part of a soot particle. And this leads to uh, thermoplastic deposits. Uh, this is a slow, slow process. So when you have this happening in your system, it will take a long time before uh, deposits are being formed. But we have seen uh, instances in factories and plants where uh, the filters were completely clogged up with these kind of uh, uh, thermoplastic deposits or, or soot. Uh, that completely clogged the filters and even led to valve plugging uh, or startup issues in some, uh, some environments. So um, this is also a very important uh, factor to, to monitor in your oil. Another degradation mode that we see, uh, metal soaps and phosphate esters, uh, they can uh, react, so metals basically react with acids and in the presence of water, uh, a process takes place that's called saponification, 
and basically metal soaps are being created. And this is a solid in your oil. So you can imagine you, you don't really, uh, really want that and you would want to neutralize this. So this is an example of it. You have a neutral oil, sun, oil uh, sorry, neutral soap type or an acidic uh, soap type uh, inside your oil. Here you can see an example of a real world uh, situation where uh, uh, an area where Fluitech was actually uh, analyzing the, the soap. And we were brought in uh, by the US military because this is a, an aircraft carrier by the US military, uh, which had an, a, an aircraft elevator uh, forming these kind of deposits um, as a reaction between the degradation byproducts of the oil uh, and water and salt and acids in the system. And this creates this metal soap that is clogging uh, the whole system. So just to give you a high over summary here, we have various causes and effects uh, working on phosphate esters. So this can be uh, microdieseling. Uh, the most common aspect that we see is hydrolysis, uh, leach metals leading to, uh, to soap formation and oxidation. And all these various degradation methods can uh, result in various effects on hydrolysis leads to acid formation, microdieseling leads to soot formation, leach metals leads to uh, metal soaps, and oxidation leads to varnish compounds being formed. So these are the various and most common degradation methods of phosphate esters. So that's all good and well, very nice that we know this, but we of course would also like to act upon it, we would like to do something. So the first thing uh, we would want to do is to look at condition monitoring. What, what can we do to, um, to prevent this from happening? So here you see an example of a traditional oil analysis report. Um, in this case, this is actually a very old report. You can see this from the SUS and there's no ISO code in here, but it's just to, to illustrate uh, that we would recommend that anyone that operates a phosphate ester fluid uh, works with an independent lab to create high value data to base your condition monitoring program on. I think that's very important. Uh, to, uh, to maintain your, uh, your phosphate ester fluid. So understanding the types of acids in the fluid is very important. Uh, so apart from the TEM number, you can do acid titration. Uh, this shows um, the amount of stronger acids and weaker acids that are uh, in, the, in the fluid. This gives you a more rounder uh, understanding of the acidic content of your fluid compared to just an acid number and it could, uh, could give you a bit more of a predictive analysis as to when the oil is, is going to fail. Um, at Fluitech we have been using our ruler test, uh, which is uh, ASTM D6971, which is um, a test that measures phenolic antioxidants in, uh, in a turbine oil mostly, um, but can be used for any uh, industrial oil that uses phenolics. Um, so phenolics is also something, alcohol phenols, that is being generated during the hydrolysis and degradation process. So we can actually use our rule of view test to measure the increase in phenolic content of the oil, um, which is a similar chemistry to phenolic antioxidants, which we have been doing. So LSV or linear sweep voltammetry, which is the technology that's being used by our ruler, can also help to identify, uh, to identify acids. So this is the titration curve, as you can see, D664. And here you can see the, the ruler test. And you can see the correlation with the stronger acids uh, that show up here in the ruler and uh, the, the weaker acids as well, uh, which are formed by the hydrolysis uh, uh, process. And you can see that the ruler test is a reference test. So this is the new oil uh, profile. Then you see that hydrolysis is taking place, which ends up in a very high acid number. So ruler can also be a good predictive uh, test. The ASTM group is actually currently working on a, on a new method, uh, incorporating our ruler um, to, to prescribe linear sweep photometry uh, to identify phenols and to identify alkyl phenols uh, as degradation method. So this would be a great step because at least part of these acids that are being formed will lead to varnish and deposits. So the ruler can be a great tool to prevent, uh, to predict uh, when this will happen. 
Here you can see another example of the ruler picking up alkyl phenols, which can cause oxidation. And the ruler gives you a value that can be used as a standard for condition monitoring uh, practices. Typically, a value of greater than 12,000 units is critical. And here you can see that both the red and the black lines are above the critical value. There is usually also a correlation between ruler values that are high and the darkening of MPC patches, because these compounds that the ruler is picking up actually will also show up uh, typically in the MPC. So MPC is another test which is designed for turbine oils, and that's actually designed to, to measure the varnish potential uh, and has an ASTM method of D6, uh, sorry, D7843. However, this is actually also a useful test uh, in uh, phosphate ester fluids. And what we see here is that the high acid levels do not correspond directly to the, uh, to the high MPC, and uh, EHC systems yield a wide variety of deposits. So, for example, you see here, what this means is you'll see uh, an MPC value that's very high, but there's a low acid number still. So here the MPC is very useful because uh, what, we, what we can detect with the MPC here, that in this case, it's actually microdiesel. And you can see the patch is very dark and very uh, soot-like in, in, uh, in appearance. And that's because that's actually what it is. There is a lot of soot on this patch. So you do not see this in the, 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 the acidity. You do not see this in the TEM number. Uh, it will not show up even in titration, but in MPC, it will show up. So in this case, MPC is, uh, is a useful test alongside measuring uh, acidity. So how can we apply an MPC test for hydraulic systems? This is, in fact, similar to how we use it for EHC, and that's according to ASTM D7843. Uh, so we look at the delta E, and we look at the amount of oil passing through the test within a certain time. And this particular part can be more indicative of uh, contamination in PEs versus uh, turbine oils. So the amount of volume that passes through the filter um, in a certain amount of time um, in PE fluids actually gives you more indication about the type of, uh, of degradation or deposit that we are, we are dealing with here. So this combination gives a good, uh, a good addition to any condition monitoring program. So here, for example, you can also see a clear difference between the MPC tests, mainly in the color of the patch and the amount of time that it takes for the oil uh, to, to, be, to be filtered. Here you can see that it takes a long time, and here uh, a shorter time, but it's only 10 milliliter that was, uh, was filtered. So after rinsing the oxidation products, the patch remained in similar uh, color, which indicates a lot of degradation products and not a lot of oxidation byproducts. Uh, so this means uh, there is a genuine high uh, MPC uh, related to, uh, to another degradation method than, than oxidation. So this points us in, in a good direction to search further and to give a uh, give good, uh, uh, good solution. Under a microscope, we can also see the differences of the degradation byproducts or contamination that's, that also happens. For example, in number one here, you can see that the MPC patch has mostly soot, a very beautiful pattern here. Uh, which leads to or which points to to microdieseling as the main uh, culprit in this case and uh, so that that gives us very useful information for condition monitoring and we know that we need to look at microdieseling in the system how it's happening and how we can prevent this and the number two here you can see that it's soot but also organic uh, varnish meaning acidic byproducts and oxidation byproducts in this case on the patch so this means there is various degradation modes uh, taking place uh, there is microdieseling, uh, there is hydrolysis, which probably leads uh, to higher acidity. And uh, as a result of hydraulics, you'll, you also get oxidation byproducts. And after rinsing the patch, you also see the metal soaps, which are solid metal particles that are uh, sticking to the patch, uh, become visible. So also soap formation in this, uh, this particular case was, uh, was present. So the MPC monitor, uh, monitoring range, uh, the values for um, phosphate ester fluids are a bit more critical around the, the 30 mark. So this is different from uh, turbine oils where the degradation is a little bit more gradual. Uh, so we actually have a higher range where we say it's monitor, but here um, you would really say, say that above 30, you would really need to take action uh, with your phosphate acid fluid. And when your MPC is above 60, 
we would really recommend some further tests to see if the fluid is even salvageable, uh, because that, that really points to uh, high degradation taking place. So we would need to do a bit more research in that case. But please, if you use an MPC test, test make sure that uh, it, uh, it stays below 30. So here we can see the suggested test frequency and, uh, and action, action limits. So we have an asset number, um, which we would really recommend to do uh, and a titration curve to look at stronger and weaker assets um, on a monthly basis because acidity uh, can spiral out of control relatively quick. As I mentioned uh, in the autocatalytic uh, process, uh, the depiction in a few slides earlier. So that's why we recommend this month monthly. Action limits would be 0 0.2, so relatively low uh, asset number will already uh, validate an action. MPC also on a monthly basis because it gives a very good indication of orange and suit being, being formed and action limits of 30. Water content, another very critical uh, thing to measure for your phosphate acid fluids because they are hydrolytic, especially the butylated chemistries. So uh, you would want to keep your water uh, below 500 ppm. Actually, we rather see water below 150 ppm. That's, uh, that's even better. So because of the hydrolytic uh, um, nature, we definitely recommend this to be done monthly. Elemental analysis, this indicates typically soap formation uh, also can be uh, uh, pointing towards already wear taking place in the system. This happens more gradually and it's not uh, uh, so critical uh, immediately. So we would say quarterly uh, tests and action limits of, of five. A very useful test here is the linear sweep voltammetry, which can uh, detect the presence of alkyl phenols and alcohols uh, to be done on a monthly basis to prevent uh, um, the autocatalytic process from taking hold and to prevent varnish and deposits from forming. Resistivity, this is also a good indication of the hydrolytic uh, autocatalytic pro process. So you would want to have a res resistivity that is above five, definitely. Um, however, this is uh, uh, an additional method and uh, um, measuring it on a quarterly basis uh, is actually uh, uh, good enough, so we recommend quarterly here. The resistivity indicates electrokinetic uh, uh, degradation, so that's a good and useful test to add. So that's how we can measure the phosphate ester fluids, but what can we do to maintain them? How can we make sure they operate within their uh, that are operational and their desired um, parameters. So maintaining these type of fluids, uh, if we look at a very high overview here, um, it revolves around uh, a few key things. These fluids, we have to keep in mind, are more sensitive than regular oils. And when they start to degrade, they go quickly. It's like falling off a cliff. So it makes sense to maintain them tightly within very uh, low tolerances and short intervals between oil tests. If you look at my previous slides, you'll see that we recommend most tests to be done monthly. Uh, so if you do this, if you maintain phosphate ester fluids uh, uh, very neatly and in a clean and dry condition, they can be exceptionally long lasting fluids and very well performing fluids. The benefit of phosphate ester fluids is that they typically do not have sacrificial additives like antioxidants or uh, or uh, extreme pressure add additives, for example. They have no inherent chemistry that can create degradation byproducts. So if you remove the degradation byproducts that are being formed within the oil, you can have exceptionally long lasting and carefree products because the base uh, chemistry of the fluid will remain intact. So for example, we see that electrostatic filtration is a method and that works really well to remove all the micron sized degradation products that are formed by micro dieseling. So, as mentioned, these are sub, uh, subatomic, submicron particles um, that are in your system. So, this, these are very efficiently removed by electrostatic uh, uh, filtration. Another very uh, uh, all rounded uh, method is acid scavenging. Acid scavenging filtration can remove a number of typical phosphate ester degradation uh, products, such as acids, metal soaps, varnish compounds, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very nice uh, technology for these, uh, these kind of degradation products. 
mechanical filtration or particle filtration is something that we would always to take out the stores of the oil, prevent them from becoming, uh, becoming an issue. Um, and uh, membrane air drying. So we would always recommend some form of, uh, of air drying in the presence of a phosphate ester fluid to prevent water ingression uh, into the oil, uh, which will start the hydrolytic uh, process. Um, also keep in mind that the uh, ruler test and uh, MPC test can help you uh, doing preventive maintenance here. So for example, here we see the effect of an elect electrostatic uh, filtration case study. Uh, we see that there is a significant reduction in the NPC from 67 to 13. The patch weight, which can also be indicative of, uh, of soot, um, had a 73% reduction. Um, for some time, no change in resistivity were observed, um, but after media treatment, the resistivity of the fluid also increased uh, to very comfortable 15.1. So very good results. And here you can see the visual before uh, electrostatic filtration, the oil was black. This is normally what you would expect to get from a diesel truck uh, oil tank. And, uh, and the MPC patch was also uh, pretty critical. We put in a nice, neatly electrostatic collector and the MPC dropped to 13. Uh, the, the oil uh, condition in terms of uh, appearance significantly improved. And you can see that everything was nicely soaked up by the electrostatic collector. So another uh, very good method for, uh, for dealing with acids and varnish compounds is actually acid scavenging media. And this is uh, uh, covering a wide range of degradation methods. As you can see, stronger acids and weaker acids and alcohol phenols, which are the main precursor to varnish. Uh, metal soaps and, sorry, metals and soaps can also be removed. So that's an uh, added uh, plus point. It also uh, takes away some of these solids. Um, so as you can see here, it's, uh, it's a good uh, good media, especially if it's tailored to the fluid that's in use, uh, to 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 restore the the, uh, the resistivity of the fluid, to bring down the acid number, to bring down the MPC, uh, to prevent varnish from forming, to bring down the ruler values, uh, and a good method to increase the, the life of the fluid. So FluidTag actually has the Enjoy 9, which is a unique um, media because it's tailored to phosphate ester fluids and it removes all assets inside phosphate ester fluids. So with its tailored media it allows to have a positive aspect on many, uh, sorry, positive effect on many aspects of the oil uh, including also the formation of varnish compounds. So uh, here you can see the customized media treatment um, of in-service phosphate ester. You can see here um, the new phosphate ester fluid uh, line is here, and then you can have various medias acting on it. Uh, so this is the, the in-service phosphate ester creating, as we have seen earlier, uh, a lot of strong acids and a lot of weaker acids, so a lot of alkyl phenols as well. And you can see from the titration curve that our NGO9, which is here, actually has by far the best performance of all the acid scavenging media. Uh, because we use a, a tailor-made filtration uh, uh, media system. This is also confirmed by doing the ruler test on the levels of alkyl phenols, the weaker acids that are uh, primarily causing varnish. So you can also see the in-service uh, fluid with uh, one media that's not performing so well, another media. Um, this is the new fluid and actually our customized media even uh, has better performance uh, restores it to a better condition than the new fluid was. So not all medias, as you have already seen, are equal. So here we can see various uh, medias tested on uh, the same very old and degraded fluid. So this fluid was really, uh, you can see this also from, uh, from this line here, the fluid was completely spent uh, in a very bad shape. So we tested this on, on various media. And you will see that different medias have different strong and weak points. So for example, if you want to remove the alkyl phenols, you want to prevent varnish, if this is your priority, uh, you can choose media C. You see here that the alkyl phenols are removed, but it has, for example, very limited impact on resistivity. The resistivity is still close to five. Then if you want to increase resistivity, the best media will be media D. However, this media, again, has a limited impact on uh, alkyl phenols. So that's where it, uh, it comes short a little bit. 
there are various uh, medias that were good at removing the metal soaps and assets in this case. Um, but the, the point here is that by, uh, by combining different medias and by, uh, by tailoring the medias to the application and to the situation at the customer, which is where, where Fluidex expertise comes in, we can actually uh, make a very good all-rounder uh, media that can tackle these, these issues. Uh, we also think that uh, it should be a no-brainer when you operate an EHG system with a phosphate ester uh, to implement very good water control systems. Uh, so here you can see uh, membrane air drying as an example, because in practice we still encounter a lot of fluids that have a PPM uh, of more than 1,000, a water PPM of more than 1,000, and uh, more than 500 can be detrimental to a phosphate ester. We actually recommend limits of below 500 ppm, as I mentioned earlier. Our own recommended limit would be um, would be 150 ppm, um, and this can be achieved by operating a dry air blanketing system. The unique aspect of a phosphate ester fluid is that it's heavier than water, and water molecule molecules in a phosphate ester naturally migrate to the top of the fluid. So if you have a dry air blanketing system over the top, you will naturally extract the water molecules from the fluid and they will evaporate and your water level will go down. Um, you have to take care here not to blast the, the air onto the fluid too strongly. So you have to uh, follow the guidelines for air pressure because if you blast the air too strongly, the water molecules can actually ingress into the oil and this can lead to hydrolysis. So it's very important to, to, uh, to tailor the system and to calibrate the system perfectly so you have the right air pressure. So we have seen examples of inventive uh, companies using uh, fans or whatever methods to dry their oil, but then the pressure of the, the air is causing water molecules actually to ingress back into the oil. Uh, or sometimes we have an air circulation system uh, in the plants that can interfere with a stable dry blanket over the, over the oil, and this can actually interfere with this process of, uh, of taking water molecules out. Um, so uh, bottom line is make sure that a proper calibrated dry air blanketing system is, uh, is recommended. So it's going quite, quite well. So we already have uh, reached here a bit of a conclusion. Um, so Phosphate ester fluids are required for safety uh, safety standards because of their uh, self-extinguishing properties. Despite the higher costs and uh, sensitivities, uh, the phosphate ester fluid is basically the only choice to prevent a catastrophic fire in certain uh, plants and especially in the EHC fluid. And uh, their specific chemistry actually poses some uh, some some uh, some challenges. But rest assured that we are fortunate that there is a phenomenal amount of research and knowledge on phosphate ester fluids. And um, there's a lot of knowledge available on how to manage them. And it can turn from an enemy to a friend. If you properly manage phosphate ester fluids, they become a very strong asset with an extremely long uh, service, uh, service life. ASTM is actually currently uh, working on MPC and linear sweep voltammetry methods. So there's no uh, ASTM methods. These are other methods uh, that are being, being recommended here. So unfortunately, the ASTM moves uh, not as fast as we would like, but uh, they are working on it. So there will be at some point in the future a good step to include MPC and uh, ruler testing as a preventive maintenance in uh, phosphate ester fluids. However, please do not wait for the ASTM and uh, implement these tests uh, as soon as, as possible. Um, also, in terms of uh, methods to control the contamination of the fluid, we recommend if you have microdiesel and soup formation, electrostatic filtration, uh, customized acid scavenging media to reduce acids, whatever the acids that uh, are present, and also to reduce the, uh, the, the formation of, uh, of varnish and uh, metal soaps. And we recommend always to have some form of membrane air drying, which is properly calibrated uh, to accurately remove the moisture and prevent the hydrolysis from taking place in the first place. So that's a very good preventive uh, measurement.
Uh, so I'll say it again, applying the right condition monitoring strategy uh, on this side and the right contamination control on uh, the user side will allow you to have a very long life and friendly fluid in your EHC system. Okay, so that, um, that summarizes the, the topic of phosphate ester fluids. I would just like to conclude a little bit about, uh, about Fluitech itself. Um, so Fluitech is actually a company that is trying to, to change the way that lubricants in the industry and hydraulics are being, being used and perceived. We work through analyzing uh, providing methods of flushing systems, uh, re additizing systems, and keeping the systems clean, such as our Endure 9, but we also have various other filtration methods for uh, industrial fluids. Um, this all leads to life extension of the fluids and significantly reduces the industrial waste and uh, increases the bottom line of customers. So I've mentioned this in the beginning, but this is actually the way that we do this. And uh, this is also the way we see the industry moving towards the, the future. So we do this by managing, uh, measuring the condition of the, of the industrial fluid and uh, protect asset uh, functionality. Consultment uh, of consultation through uh, sharing our knowledge, which I think today is also uh, part of that, and uh, making tailor-made treatment uh, technologies uh, for specific situations of the customer. Our product lines consist of education. So we have various uh, lubrication academies uh, taking place virtually uh, now due to uh, due to COVID. Uh, before we, we had them on, uh, on on site on locations, but uh, now it's virtually where we share knowledge. And as I mentioned today, is also part of our education strategy to uh, to make sure that we we share our knowledge with the market uh, to help uh, people manage fluids better. Uh, condition monitoring with ruler and MPC, contamination and varnish control with our ESP systems, but also the NGO9. Uh, Decon and Boost VR or Decon EO, which are uh, re additizing systems, replenishing antioxidants, uh, fortifying the fluids additive systems to better resist uh, its, its working conditions, and oil life extension uh, also by re additizing the fluids uh, or even by uh, factory fill uh, or um, uh, filling the, the equipment with our Infinity Turbine oil which is the only turbine oil at the moment, which gives a 10 year deposit control warranty. And uh, using our unique experience and technology, we have been able to do this, uh, where the, most of the major oil producers uh, cannot do this uh, at the moment. So this just gives you a bit of an idea about fluid tech and what we are doing. And uh, yeah, we would be happy to help you uh, not only with your phosphate ester fluids, but with any other um, industrial fluid that uh, might benefit from this, this approach. So I think that concludes my part, um, just nicely within the hour. So that's good because we have some time for questions. So I would like to thank you uh, for now for your attention. I hope it was clear. And uh, back to you, Adi. Yeah, uh, thank you, Lars. It's very good explanation and clear explanation. And we have a lot of questions over okay. here. Hope the time will be uh, enough for us. Uh, okay. Maybe for the first question, uh, mm -hmm. uh, why resin on uh, existing filter in power generation could not able to reduce uh, acid number value? So the, the resin is uh, specific for uh, varnish compounds um, and varnish compounds, they are not uh, uh, not always acids. So some acids, they will lead to varnish compounds, um, but they are not uh, acids themselves. So acids react and they form, uh, they form varnish compounds, which is being removed by, by the ESP system. Uh, so the, the resin media, um, but it does not stop the acids from being, uh, being formed. So that the acids basically remain in the system. So we need specific asset scavenging media to uh, to remove the assets. Okay, okay. Hope uh, this is will answer the question. And then uh, the second question regarding the MPC: What mm -hmm. is the standard value for the patch weight target for phosphate ester fluid? This is the first question, and then the second question is regarding 
what what does it mean limit number of MPC does it mean farmers start to farming and is it possible to monitor farmers from early farming mm -hmm. um, okay so the, the patch weights and uh, there's not really a fixed limit because different um, different varnish compounds have different weights so it's always a combination of uh, looking at what type of uh, what type of contamination are we looking at at the MPC patch and this needs to be correlated to the weight so if we know it's soot then we can do a correlation to weight if we know it's uh, um, it's another compound then we can correlate this to the weight of the patch so there's not really a straight answer to that question unfortunately on the second part the MPC value indeed means uh, that there is varnish uh, potential of the oil, so there's varnish being created in the system. Um, if you want to catch this early on, um, well, the only way to, the MPC is actually already a preventive test, so it's already a way of giving you an early warning uh, system. So that's the, the, the best test that we have now that gives you the earliest possible prediction. If you want to prevent varnish from forming, um, the filtration media, a resin media, or an NGRIX would be would be needed to, to prevent the formation uh, from varnish. Uh, unfortunately, um, oils and especially phosphoric esters they are prone to form varnish while they're on operation. So, good condition monitoring and uh, contamination control is key. I hope that answers the question. It's not a direct answer, but okay, Lars. Uh, hope uh, you can. Uh, email us if there are any some um, question anymore. But yeah. uh, uh, we can continue another question. Uh, sure. So this is from user that uh, have a phosphate ester fluid, and when he uh, water content under five hundred ppm, maybe using a purifier, the mm -hmm. acid number will increasing more than 0 0.2. Is there any correlation about water content and acid number? So water content is uh, low, below mm -hmm. 500 ppm, but the acid number increasing 0 0.2. Mm -hmm. there yeah, there, no, there is uh, there is a little bit, but not uh, a direct correlation because even at low water content, hydrolysis can take place. And as I mentioned, what we often see is that when uh, there is a moisture control system in place but it's not properly calibrated, um, there is still some water ingression happening within the oil, and this can, can still lead to, to acid formation. Uh, what we can do in this kind of situation, it's a very good question actually, what we can do in this kind of situation is look at the total oil report and maybe look at some, some trending. Uh, so if you have done, let's say, monthly reports uh, perhaps we can find some correlation. So Fluitech can definitely help you with that. So if you if you are willing, you can send us the information, and we can do some more research. Okay, uh, very nice. Uh, uh, for for Ashadi, maybe we, you can share us the oil analysis report, include the trending, so Lars can have a comprehensive uh, data. Yeah, so he can have a more correlation from the oil analysis report. Okay, uh, we continue. Another question, Lars? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, uh, about the membrane air drying, uh, mm -hmm. how to maintain the membrane air drying if this unit already installed? Um, so we have various uh, methods of, uh, you, you mean if the membrane air drying system is already installed or if the, the, the turbine is, the EHE is installed? Uh, what maintenance is required for membrane air drying? Um, that's that's not, not very, um, it's nothing that, that springs specifically to mind. Uh, I think it's just a matter of checking the uh, the, uh, the system for for giving the correct uh, uh, correct air pressure that's the most important thing but nothing specific uh, springs to mind now uh, for just a general general maintenance uh, according to the OEM or the manual recommendation 
Okay, and so it will be um, need to check with the OAM, is it? Yeah, so in the manual, it, it gives just general uh, prescriptions on how to check it and how to uh, make sure it's operating within the normal conditions. So as long as it's operating within the normal conditions, then uh, it should be should be good. But the most important part is to check the air pressure, uh, that it's not uh, not too high or not too low, that you have a good, clean uh, blanket over your uh, your oil. Okay, okay. Thank you. And then uh, we can continue another question. Is there any treatments that we'll do, should we do to maintain acid number not to increase rapidly? As we know, acid number is one of many causes of varnish in hydraulic system. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the, yeah. yeah, so the, the, main, the main treatment, uh, um, if, you, if you do not have a high acid number yet, uh, we would always recommend uh, a dry, dry air blanketing system to prevent water ingression from the oil and hydrolysis from, from taking place. Um, if you do have, so it starts with operating your phosphate ester fluid in a clean and dry environment. So you need to prevent water ingression, so you need to keep your water level low. Um, you need to uh, prevent contamination because contamination will also lead to, to acid formation. Uh, and if that, um, if that maintains your acid at a low level, it's, it's very good. Uh, if you already have experienced higher level of acids, uh, then the only way to, to correct this is by uh, putting in uh, acid scavenging media, such as our NGO9, for example. Okay, okay. And then uh, we can continue about uh, what does means electrical Resistivity value increase and decrease. Maybe you can more detail yeah. about electrical resistivity. Yeah. So the the resistivity is uh, the, the 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 resistance of the fluid uh, to to uh, conduct an electric current. So the higher the resistivity, uh, the less uh, con conductive the fluid is, which is important uh, because you you want the fluid to be. Uh, non-conductive because you don't want to have it, it needs to be an insulator for electrical currents uh, if it does not do that you can get electrical electrical currents um, running through your system which then leads to uh, to spark discharge and uh, could uh, could eventually uh, degrade degrade the fluid so resistivity is important to to uh, yeah, to prevent uh, these kind of processes from happening in the oil so it, it refers to the ability of the oil uh, of conducting an electric current. That's, so the higher the resistivity, the lower the oil's ability to, uh, to conduct electricity. Okay. Okay, Lars. Uh, thank you. Maybe uh, we will have another last three questions. Sure. And then after we can uh, close and if there are any question like more you, uh, at the you can email yeah uh, yes, another question about how to handling electrohydraulic control oil from the storage and maintain EHG oil on the reservoir do to EHG oil quite, quite sensitive with the water and what standard related yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, definitely you would want to keep it in an indoor, um, dry, the temperature control place if, uh, if possible, um, high moisture environment. So this is challenging, of course, in, in Indonesia and the tropics. Um, it would be advisable to, to, to keep the package uh, close. So um, what's not advisable within phosphate acid fluid is, for example, to, to uh, to open the, the, the IBC or to open the drum and to, uh, to decant half of it and to leave half of it there. This is a very bad idea for phosphate ester. So you would need to um, have these kind of practices implemented that you always leave the drum in a closed condition or the IBC um, and to check the water content uh, if you have stored the product for longer than, uh, than one month in your warehouse. Uh, it's always recommended to check the water content uh, before you uh, uh, 
and you use it. Um, so keep the, the package closed. Uh, do not uh, do not open it and uh, and store it again. And that's the that's the first thing. When it's in the reservoir, um, again uh, keeping it dry and uh, uh, and clean is very important to prevent contamination and keep a dry air blanketing system on it uh, to prevent uh, moisture from ingressing into the oil. Okay, still related with the reservoir, second mm -hmm. question. What shall be the tank head relative humidity? Sorry? What shall be the tank head relative humidity? Um, oh, I'm not sure on that on that figure. I don't know that from the top of my head, but I can I can check it out and come back to it later if there's a general recommendation on that. Relative humidity, okay. And then uh, last question from this webinar session: um, How to maintain the ESP? I believe ESP and durian. Mm -hmm. How to maintain the ESP? Um, so, the the first part for the ESP uh, um, in any ESP uh, um, is is to to make sure that the, the filters are not saturated and that the flow rates are correct. Uh, those two things are are the main uh, the main uh, parameters to to monitor on your on your ESP system. So, filter saturation. Uh, can be in some ESP variants can be seen on the ESP itself. There's a there's a window there, uh, which, which gives you an indication of how the, the resin is looking. But that's not for all ESPs. If the ESP does not have this, um, it's a matter of uh, of time, looking at how long your filters have been in operation, and your e your NPC results, which can indicate whether the filters filters are getting saturated or not. If the filters are saturated, you would need to change the, the filters. Um, on the electrical part, uh, that's also, again, I would refer to the, the manual and feel free to reach out if there's any any issues or any questions on that. Uh, we can look at it more specifically. Okay. Uh, one question, Lars, still? Yeah, sure. Can yes, we can do one okay. more. Yeah, sure. Can we use a one micron filter for EHC fluid may additive to go out? So the question is, can we use a one micron filter for EHC fluid? Um, there is no, I don't, the, the problem is not, um, not the additive in that case. So I do not have any concern uh, chemically on the oil. Uh, what you want to prevent is uh, to have uh, um, too much back pressure uh, or too much, uh, uh, how do you call it, too much um, relative pressure being being formed around the filter membrane. Because um, this can, if you already have a degraded oil, this can accelerate the formation of, of metal soap. So uh, if your EHC fluid is completely healthy and all your uh, your tests are, if you do, uh, a wide variety of tests, uh, the ones that we have recommended, and everything is within normal parameters. I do not see a problem with it. Um, the problem will occur if you have already some contamination in your system, some metal soaps forming. Um, these will will very quickly block a one micron filter, and uh, you know you will very quickly run into an issue. Um, so, it's it's possible. Yes, there's no issue with additives. It's it will not. Um, uh, take out any additives, but um, it needs to be monitored, monitored closely to prevent filter plugging. That would be my recommendation. Okay, Lars. Uh, okay. Thank you for your thank you. explanation. And um, I try to summarize, even you already summarized, but I summarize okay. in Bahasa. <laughs> okay, sure. Jadi, uh, untuk Materi sesi webinar pada siang hari ini terkait dengan fosfat ester fluid fundamental dan maintenance dari mulai terkait dengan degradation modes yang kita tadi sudah ketahui yaitu metode uh, mode hidrolisis dan me mode mikrodieseling terus kemudian juga sudah di share 
terkait dengan uh, condition monitoring method salah satunya dari mulai uh, MPC terus kemudian kemudian tentunya yang penting acid number water content dan ada opsi terkait dengan pengujian ruler khusus terkait dengan fenols dan uh, untuk maintenance sendiri ada opsi terkait dengan uh, ESP maupun air membrane uh, drying mungkin uh, untuk sesi webinar ini terima kasih sebelumnya kami ucapkan kepada Bapak dan Ibu yang telah mengikuti sampai dengan pada sore hari ini and thanks to you Lars for this great sharing knowledge I hope we can have a joint session again in next webinar. We'll be happy to. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Thank you to all the attendees and uh, I look forward to receiving more questions. Please, uh, Adi, feel free to send me uh, any any questions, comments. Uh, we'll be happy to look into it. Thank you very much. Terima kasih. Kami ucapkan kembali Bapak dan Ibu. Selamat siang. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi